Greetings and welcome to the Undivide Project podcast, the Changemakers Edition, where we highlight the people who are doing their very best to do good for people, public, and planet. And my name is Monica Sanders, and I'm very excited to be welcoming Eloisa Lewis, the founder of New Climate Culture. Welcome and thank you so much for making time for us, Eloisa. Thank you, Monica. So I read about the consulting firm that you've started, and I'm excited to speak with you about it because, you know, there are fixed ideas amongst the general public about what a consulting firm does and what can be accomplished. But what you're offering is an alternative that has the potential to help people not only do a better job of constructing built environments or financial systems or what have you, but to help people interact with nature and live a more sustainable and healthy lifestyle. So I'd love to hear more about what you're offering and why you founded New Climate Culture. Thank you. Yeah. Um, So really what all of New Climate Culture can be summarized, all of our activities surround is biodiversity enhancing techniques, practices, and technologies. Um, Why biodiversity is so important is because that is the ultimate technology for uh, eliminating environmental toxins in our water, in our soil, in our air, and in our food. And so when we think about what we're consuming in any environment, in any part of the world, we all know that we share parts of these cycles being the air cycle, water cycle, soil cycle, food cycle. So we need to really focus on um, enhancing those cycles. And that's going to be our intersection between economic solutions and for-profit climate solutions and what we need to do to sequester carbon and just stabilize um, our, our microclimates in any region that we're in so that we're not losing more species, but actually creating the circumstances for new species to emerge while we're preserving what we have on earth as very precious. Um, And so, yeah. So my company is offering B2B services where we're going to be able to look at any enterprise at any point in its scaling or it's in its development and establishment. And we're going to be able to audit the system and provide solutions, basically no stone left unturned. Um, so that we have the highest degree of integrity so we can uh, promise our clients and their clients um, genuine results. And then on the other side, we are able to provide a portfolio for investors who are interested in helping us develop business uh, that is within proven models that we've already established. Okay. Wonderful. And in the interview that you did for me with Authority Magazine, which I very much appreciate it, you talked about Project Drawdown, which, you know, I'm admitting my bias here, I think was a game changing project and still needs to be talked about. But that was an inspiration for you. Could you tell me a little bit more about your engagement with some of the people who found it? Absolutely. So I came to learn about Project Drawdown when I went to the Urban Permaculture Institute of San Francisco And I worked with the founders, Pandora Thomas and Kevin Bayek. And that was where I was certified in permaculture so that I could become a climate scientist. And um, basically, Project Drawdown is a compendium of free resources for people who are looking to understand climate solutions worldwide and how they're all interconnected um, and how they can just take immediate action. Because no matter who you are, no matter how much access to resources or time you have, there are choices that we can all make to help transition the world into a more non-toxic future and safer future with more stable climates and stable farming practices so that we just all benefit from that type of abundance. And Project Drawdown is just a great encyclopedia is what I like to call it. It's an encyclopedia that's been put together um, just like, you know, Oxford or any other group puts together an encyclopedia or in a dictionary. It's very similar with Drawdown and their focus is climate solutions. So you're able to go through that index and find all the direct research that you need to support any claims or, you know, just learn about the process of the science behind why anyone in my field is really putting certain projects in, and ranking them as like most important and to, to like uh, least important in terms of the impact of the investing and the focus of our time. 
And I do want to talk more about that, but to help our audience, all of whom probably have read some of the terms that you used in journalism, but haven't had the opportunity to get an explanation from a climate science, um, talk to us about what is permaculture? Because I've seen this defined in a variety of different ways, and but what is the actual definition? I like to define permaculture as the science of regeneration and circular economy. So it's this marriage between understanding regeneration is a biological process. So things can regenerate by either healing themselves, repairing their own bodies or reproducing. So those are two major ways of regenerating. Um, so when we're studying the healing of so the self healing of a system or the reproduction of a system, we're very concerned with how to enhance that process and um, just get a handle on understanding it at all in this life's great mystery. So that's one aspect. And then the second aspect is really plugging that into our economics so that we can have um, circular renewable economies instead of finite economies. Like there are some resources on earth that are finite. Uh, maybe we only have a certain amount of a mineral on the planet, for example. Um, so we only have a certain amount of gold on the planet, you could imagine, because gold isn't something that reproduces itself. It has to be synthesized on a molecular level to be created. And so we have like a somewhat limited source of it here. And, and then when it comes to something renewable, it's something that can regenerate. So you might think about like cows are something that are a renewable and they're much more potentially abundant than gold because cows can have as many babies as is possible within a system, whether it's ethical or not is a secondary question. But just thinking about things in terms of supply. We're thinking about focusing on things that can renew and trying to, for example, like a fossil fuel, it takes, has a life cycle of millions, if not billions of years to be created under pressure under the earth's crust. And so it's fairly finite in human life terms. Um, however, we can create a propane alternative using compost, and that would be a renewable alternative to a fossil fuel that has the same function that can easily be retrofitted into systems. So using like a biogas that's being generated from our compost and compost is pretty much infinitely around us because compost would be any agricultural waste or byproduct. It would be food waste or byproduct. And it would also even include human manure as a potential source for, you know, powering our stoves as with a clean gas and clean source that wouldn't involve extracting from the earth because not only are fossil fuels finite resources in terms of the human life scale but they're also the the harvesting of those resources is incredibly damaging for all of the species that surround and the air quality and the water quality highly volatile unstable form of harvesting and so we from a risk and insurance standpoint, we want to lower the risk on our uh, capacity to really damage our environment and therefore our own bodies by just sourcing from renewable and more stable renewable sources that don't cause a, don't have the potential to cause as much damage to the environment, um, meaning that they're just a lower insurance risk for our, for us and our securities. Thank you, and that you know touches on another topic that people who think about disasters and climate change and risk is there's now a phenomenon where not even connected to permaculture, but connected to our financial system, where we have certain parts of, we're sitting in the United States, but I don't think this is a uniquely U.S. phenomenon, where insurance companies are rolling back their security against certain kinds of, of spaces and property because of this outsized risk. And I don't think that the residents necessarily connect that to non-renewable pieces of their system. They see it as simply a financial issue. Absolutely. And um, another interesting development in global economics right now, um, I was working with an investment group out of Australia recently that's been collaborating in Australia, and they've been able to do a lot of 
proof and work with insurance companies there about how um, the valuation of a property is increased with increased biodiversity. So that's now also a positive trend in real estate development and um, security investment, because that that's a great thing for, for us, for, for myself, but also just for, you know, everyone worldwide, because when we start to evaluate biodiversity with an actual, with understanding that it's the most valuable resource on earth, then we're no longer like in the kind of delusional spectrum that we've been in the past where we ignored that truth and pretended like we can um, destroy biodiversity with no consequence and that there would be something that would be more valuable than biodiversity itself. And so that's just something that I find really optimistic and, and a trend that needs to happen absolutely worldwide, but I think is happening. And I do see a lot of action being taken. So I think that I just want to assure people that I think that this community that is concerned with air quality, water quality and biodiversity and food quality and wellness, like whatever community that is, because I think it, it spans across borders, identities, political you know, affiliations. It kind of connects people across religions and everything. I think that there's a lot of people who are making incredible changes right now. And I'm just really, I'm really optimistic, excited about that. We should be excited. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, in public infrastructure investment here in the United States. And I've had the privilege of working in some places in Latin America where the terminology is nature-based solutions is giving me hope that that is a trend that will stick because I'm hoping that the assurance that comes with a major public investment in these types of solutions will encourage private industry to follow suit. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I really think that like having climate smart events and festivals and restaurants and hotels is going to be a huge part of the cultural shift because once you've tasted that food that's coming from that organic eco village or that wild crafted wild foraged food, I think that it's undeniable or not only the food, but the beauty supplements and hair treatments and medicinal lifelong, you know, lifestyle benefits and things like that. I think it becomes easy to like, just understand what the hype is about. If you haven't been exposed to that yet, I think I just want to encourage people to, to try something new. Maybe there's a cafe or a hotel that specializes in, in, ecosystem restoration and enhancement and that could be like the perfect opportunity to to see for yourself like is there a difference between you know a seeded watermelon and a, and a gmo watermelon or a wild corn or wild grain right. and a highly cultivated you know toxic basically pesticide alternative like i think that i think the proof is is going to be there for everyone if they if they give something else a try. I would agree with that. And one of the exciting things about this journey is getting to speak to people from different disciplines and silos and seeing how they interact with each other and also getting a sense of what's out there. So people who are listening, you know, we've spoken to someone who specializes in making concerts and large scale artistic events sustainable. And also using that as an opportunity to talk about the UN development goals and what that actually means on an individual level. Because I think some of us struggle with when we get the IPCC report or we read about it in journalism and how well science is reported is the topic of another podcast. But depending on how you receive that information, sure. what to actually do with it. So it's encouraging to see people taking our everyday experience and making, uh, giving us the opportunity to see it through the lens of sustainability. Yes. I just think that, you know, producers, whether that's a producer of an event or the producer of a good, um, like a material good, industrial good, food good, whatever, clothing, anyone who's in the realm of production has is the first line of defense and of transition in the economy. And that's where the responsibility should lie first and foremost. Absolutely, consumers have responsibility, but even more so as producers, we really need to take up the reins and make sure that we're doing best practices. And so that's another reason why I created my company was to just help producers of all kinds to 
to help the people who are already doing it the best to make sure that their messages and practices are reaching the world and the people who need to transition their practices to help them do it in a way that is really low cost and high yield. Because I think that the number one concern for anyone I'm working with, uh, or maybe not everyone, but a lot of people is how do I make sure that, you know, I don't lose money while I transition to being more climate smart. And I can assure people that it's largely kind of depend in, mo in many ways, it's going to lower your cost over time. So costs might be more, a little bit more expensive upfront, maybe not, not typically, but maybe, and, but they are going to diminish over time. And in some cases, depending on again, what industry you're in and, and what we're transitioning in some cases, we're transitioning people from yes, like some initial investment, but down to a zero cost over the course of five to 25 years, which is just incredible. And I think that again, there's a solution to every problem. And a lot of times problems are the sum of just discussion and gossip and hearsay and misinformation and scarcity and fear. And uh, there's just no need for that in a time like this when we know that humans are just so capable and we really shouldn't be making excuses for not transitioning when there's people out there like myself that can guarantee that nobody can do it at a, at a lower cost. And so, yeah, I think that there's so many consultants and there's so many groups and we, we only need more. Like I'm not really concerned with um, competition in this field. And I would always encourage anyone who's interested to get into sustainability to absolutely do it because the future has to be sustainable itself. So there's not, it's something that, being a leader or being an authority on what is sustainable and what is regenerative will never go out of style. That will never be something that becomes obsolete for an economy or for a region. That's something that's always going to be valuable because we have to carry on that knowledge generation to generation. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a wonderful perspective to put forward and I hope people are taking to that in account because you use a term and I'm glad that you used it. We're talking about scarcity in another conversation, I was talking about the scarcity mindset, this binary thinking that keeps us sometimes from believing that in order for something to be fully sustainable or accessible here, something has to be diminished over there or that there's winners and losers as opposed to understanding that it's not an either or, it's not a binary choice, it's not a scarcity mindset that we can transition to something more sustainable and we can even be so bold as to imagine different ways of what sustainable could mean for you or your company or your neighborhood or so forth or so on. Yes. And I, I've actually written a couple books and they're on non, recycled non-toxic paper with vegetable ink. It's a really cool company out of San Francisco that I work with called Greener Printer. You can check them out on shopcultureboard.com. But in my books, I use a phrase that's, that's highlighting exactly this theme in, in another way, which is to say, there's really no competition between blessings. So if we all understand ourselves as, you know, blessed and protected and welcomed and home on this planet, as it is our home planet, it is where we ourselves were cultivated and grew and, and are growing still. If we recognize that, then we can see that there's really um, an approach to life that we can take that is about sharing. And that again, in, in sharing, we're not losing. In sharing, we're exchanging mutual aid, mutual benefit, resources, and knowledge to the enhancement of the entire community. And that's what's, um, I think, really going to be important about permaculture and about the future is the idea and about the future of economics is is that we're all trending on right now that when we share and when we recognize abundance we're going to eliminate a lot of false ideas and myths that have uh, been perpetuated over the last maybe 100 200 or thousands of years depending on the culture for example i know that there's some people who like to argue that there's overpopulation and that that's somehow a, a problem on the planet. Well, for me, overpopulation is not the problem. It's actually just our agricultural techniques are inadequate for feeding our population. So it's redirecting the issue not to be like that humans shouldn't reproduce anymore and that we're like a cancer on the earth. Instead, thinking about 
okay, our current model of economics, our current model of resource distribution is threatening our our sense of self-esteem and our sense of capacity to meet our own needs as a species. So that just means we need to reevaluate our resource distribution and our agricultural techniques because We've seen throughout history, um, the most abundant agricultural civilizations actually exist in the past. Right now, our agriculture does not really compete with like that of, let's say, like the, the Mayan or the Aztec empires of Mexico at their prime because that was, um, their techniques of farming were just highly distributed compared to our own. People would be able to go out into a canal and farm in their the front of their homes. And today we don't really farm in front of our homes and where we could have canals that connect our neighborhoods where we travel by boat. So we could have our own water right in front of us. Right now we have roads. So roads destroy biodiversity instead of preserve it where canals enhance biodiversity. And of course, traveling by boat through canal is just much less energy exhaustive. So it's just getting creative. Like Sometimes I think scarcity just comes from these narratives that are rather rigid that are being fed to us, whether it's by, you know, TV, radio, even school education systems um, who have bought into these ideas and narratives versus like really kind of expanding our minds to think, why not approach the planet with an artist's mind and thinking about it from the perspective of, is there a more beautiful way to live than what we're doing? And why is it so impossible for us to live a more beautiful lifestyle and a more equitable lifestyle with more sharing? Because it seems like to me, if life is as valuable as I believe it is, then we should really be that should be the forefront of our activity is reimagining the virtual space we live in because there's the sky's the limit. I mean, my grandpa lived to be 107 years old. And when he was born, he had to ride horses to school. And when he died, people were going into recreational space travel. So when I think about humans, you know, kind of think putting limits on their self, it makes me sad because I see what my grandpa was able to witness in human ingenuity throughout his lifetime. And it makes me very confident that the sky is the limit for us when when we have our priorities set and when we really want to do something extraordinary. It's really just about getting that the community to support us and buy into these these new systems and new narratives of what's possible. Because I'm sure, you know, in 1918 or 16, when my grandpa was born, like that it was a matter of, it it would be impossible to think of a man going to the moon or, or recreational space travel or very nearly so, um, or maybe mythological and fantastical, if not impossible. And so I'd like to invite that kind of thinking back into the American consciousness of like, let's think on this mythological, fantastical level of what we can achieve in 100 or 200 or 300 years or 50 years or five years. And something that's really cool about permaculture on that note is that we've seen in so many studies that what nature will do, so a natural disaster might burn through a region, like we've seen these fires in Hawaii recently. So um, right. something like devastating might happen like that. And nature will repair itself without human intervention. So if we just put a stop, if we just put a camera there, we walked away, we would see what nature did to repair and heal itself by self-organizing just the anarchy of the wilderness. And it might take um, 100 years for it to come back to that state that it was before the, the wildfire or a similar state. With permaculture techniques, we observe that and we just speed it up. So we're just really enhancing and helping what nature would already do itself. And we can speed up timelines like that from that would normally take 100 years down to five years, down to 25 years, which is incredible. That's really quantum leaps for me. That's really cool technology for me. I think that's like, that should be as talked about as like Tesla or something else, some other technology, because that is just so fascinating that we can speed up a timeline in nature like that. And furthermore, there was a Korean researcher that I met and trained with recently who founded the Jadam Mm -hmm. program, which is uh, industrial agriculture done with 
only non-toxic pesticide, pest control, and fertilizer. And he was able to prove that um, like a natural topsoil that might take the wild forest around 300 to 500 years to mature with his techniques, we can get that down to three months. So this is just like, this is the really cool stuff that I think the public can get excited about and that it is proven and we can show people in very short, you know, in very human scale three months to five years to 25 years is not very long. That's something totally observable in our, in our lifetimes to see regeneration happen where nature would just be doing it a little bit more slowly. But since humans are so incredibly, um, you know, adapt and we're so wise in some ways, and we're so, uh, inc- we're just so, I don't know what the word is like capable that we're, we're able to just take, take something observed from nature follow that pattern and help nature do what it would do for itself. And, um, and I think that, yeah, this is what's really beautiful about what's going on in the permaculture community as well to help people understand like a little bit more about what that word means and why it's important and that it's not really abstract. It's not as abstract as it might sound. It can be grounded down to these, these examples and these different species of how, we're just we're outside in the field right now watching miracles take place like if you want to see magic and miracles i think permaculture definitely will will provide that for for people and we'll definitely put these in the show notes but you know give me some some websites some links some resources we have your books but also some other places where people can go and observe because yeah this should be the Tesla conversation or the moonshot prize conversation is how do we make this accessible? So where are some places people can go and learn and observe? Totally. Um, A few places that come to mind would be, of course, Project Drawdown. Another great maverick in the field who we have, um, his apprentice is one of our partners with my company. That would be Andrew Millison on YouTube, checking out Andrew Millison on YouTube because he has endless free resources for people who want to DIY themselves. Another person for watershed management, for understanding the, the miracle of watershed management, would be Brad Lancaster um, of Desert Water Harvesters. That's another person to check out okay. his books online. I'll definitely link you with all this information. And I think that Marin Carbon Project is pretty incredible. They, they're they going to show, uh, if anyone is interested in livestock agriculture, they're leading the world yeah. in showing how... Um, free range pasturing is the best way to sequester carbon and produce the highest quality meat for, for customers. So I just think that that's also another sector of development. Yeah. So those are just a few examples, but there's, there's so many more and definitely check out new climate culture and we'll, we'll get in touch with, with your community about your specific fire region and what your needs in your community are. Wonderful. And, you know, as you were talking, it was fascinating to hear you reference historical markers, but also being future thinking in your descriptions. And I know that, you know, in your descriptions and in some of your postings, you have in there futurist. And so as we're, you know, coming not to the end, but close to the end of our time. This is another term that I think people only think of in a really singular way. It's either really specific or super abstract. Is a term futurist. So I'd love to get you to tell us what a futurist is and then tell us about your futurism. So, right. I think that a futurist is just someone who is concerned with predicting the future and maybe designing the future as well. And so for me as a futurist, I would like to propose all kinds of designs for the future that I think are going to help create the most peace on earth and the most resources for everyone, the most abundance possible. I think that that's the most fun that I get to have, you know, as a philosopher and as a as a biologist and as a physicist and as a, as a, as an artist is thinking about like, okay, so let me take the the most difficult problems that exist for humans possible, like nuclear energy and war and aliens and um, uh, any kind of natural disaster and astrobiological failure. And how do we plan for a world where, we're going to provide for the most amount of people 
to be the most safe, secure, well, and capable of adapting to, to any kind of disaster that they're confronted with. Um, and I think that that's what makes me a futurist. And what I like to focus on is, um, really the, the answer of everything for me centers when I think, when I talk about all of that, it really centers around cooperation, mutual aid and peace. And that's, what's interesting about my research over the last decade in these topics is that the kind of unifying fabric that seems to um, solve all of our problems at once is moving toward world peace. That seems to be the project yeah. that unifies all other projects, whether that's in economics or in personal wellness and fitness or religious development, spiritual development, um, or thinking about... Um, political and economic stability or thinking about e literally aliens, like of, of all forms. I think that the best we can do is provide a good example to the rest of the universe of what a cooperative planet would look like. And I think that any other species from any other planet or on our own home planet would respect and um, potentially even um, support that. So that is what I think of as a futurist. And I would love to spend the rest of my life presenting and arguing for the, for the promotion of world peace and demonstrating how I believe it's very actionable, that there's just a very clear, simple set of steps that we need to take to achieve that. Part of it starts with um, healing our trauma openly and in therapy and just really authentic, honest communication is the center of healing trauma. And that can be very scary because, you know, being vulnerable, communicating about what hurts us yes. and what is violates us is often um, uncomfortable for our abusers or for our community. Um, but it's, it's the only way we can identify what our real problems are and how, and, and only by identifying, you know, real problems can we solve them. So it's similar to like, um, you know, if we were on a submarine and, um, there was a, a, some kind of mechanical failure and you tried to approach the captain and tell the captain about the mechanical failure, imagine that, that there's an abusive captain and he was like, don't tell me about these problems. You're lying the submarine will fail. And, and so it, it doesn't matter how many people yeah. are on the ship, you know, working on it or how many lives are at stake. If there's someone who's in a position of being a captain or a director who can't take criticism, who can't take system failure at face value, then that's what creates the failure of the framework and the system. But if we can have leaders and we can have parents and we can have community members and friends and partners in our relationships who are open to criticism, who are open to receiving trauma when we experience it. That I think is the, the closest thing we have to a seed of hope that will then grow into eventually across systems, what would be world peace? Cause it would just mean that we're able to speak truth to power in any circumstance and have a dialogue back and forth then to see how everyone's needs can be met. And, um, and do it in a way that promotes the most consent because consent violation is just a, a re-traumatization of the, of the issue. And, um, so yeah, we need, we need to promote consent across, across the board as much as possible. Um, because there are limits, I'm sure, where sometimes, um, the, ra the reins, like someone might have to take up that captainhood, even if the captain doesn't want to, to give it up. But, um, more importantly, trying to have the dialogue first and trying to demonstrate instead of going to those extremes right off the bat that might be considered like right. warfare or violation of consent. That's the last resort, not the first. And there should be many steps in between that. And um, just to set the example and to offer what the alternatives are and set the standard for communication. Because, yeah, everything is just... All matter and material in this universe is exchanging information externally and internally. We're constantly radiating, it, radiating out information from our bodies into the universe, constantly receiving information that's radiating from the universe into our bodies. To have the most um, 
equitable and peaceful relationship on that would be to be humble enough to to be wrong sometimes, but also to be um, self-confident enough to also let give the universe feedback when it's, when it's really hurting us. And so, yeah, when it comes to being a futurist, I I think it's, I try to keep everything so simple because, um, these patterns really are going to apply anywhere at the end of the day, you know, any species, any species, I think that Star Trek was great for, for highlighting that in Star Wars and stuff like any species can experience famine and war and tragedy and, um, and but also any species can experience love and hope and peace and a golden era and i think that for people who are looking to the future to create that future economically um yeah like working with new climate culture we're gonna help build that bridge of understanding um just with very simple logic so that it's clear why um, peace is within reach. I think peace is within reach. And that would be like, if I had anything to say as a futurist, it would just be that. Thank you for that. Um, And it takes us back to what you were saying in the beginning when you're talking about the start of your studies is how the mind works and how we break patterns and having the courage to break those patterns because there's something quite lovely on the other side of it if we could just reach for it. And I think we can. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your work and your research and your wonderful optimism with me and with everyone who is listening. And tell us one more time, what's the, the phrase we need to understand? There's no competition for blessings? or Yes, mo- there's no competition between blessings. If we understand our, our life is valuable, that is our first blessing, that we have life at all. And so from there, let's not make unnecessary competition. Let's have a respectful relationship, a symbiotic relationship with other species so that we, we might have to have some, you know, violence and not, I'm not advocating that everyone is vegan or Buddhist, but there has to be some kind of balance so that we don't um, basically kill all the life that we ourselves depend on. Thank you for that. Wherever you are listening and however you are listening to this podcast, I hope you take that feeling that was just offered to us with wherever you go. This has been the Undefied Project podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Deezer, and all of the usual podcast listing systems, as well as on our website, theundividedproject.org. And we will be sure to link all of the wonderful resources and where you can find and learn more about Eloisa and her work. <laughs>